Hello friends and welcome to Roar Church, Texarkana. If you want more information about anything that we do, go to jojodawson.net. You can find our YouTube videos, our blogs, where to sow, how to partner with us, any of that information. We hope that you enjoy this message. You tried to take us out, frustrate us, make us tired. But all you did was strengthen our resolve, add flame to our fire, and give us more to fight for. I'm here to put you on notice, Lucifer. The church is coming for you. We are coming for all you've stolen, coming for our loved ones you've taken captive. We will take it all back. Our strength is in him who commands kingdom and angel armies. Our trust in his ability is not misplaced. He will make you repay sevenfold what you took, and he will free all the captives. He will restore joy, peace, and freedom. We are not afraid nor intimidated by you. We are not going to cower in fear, but we will stand in faith, believing the word of our beloved. You cannot have our health. You cannot have our children. You cannot take from us without consequence. You will not keep one single victory. We are the king's legacy. We are coming for you, and all of heaven is coming with us. Can I get a roar for that? Are you fired up this morning? I don't know about you, but I am excited about God. He is on the move. When we were singing that this morning, I was just picturing the Lord just stepping down and doing what only He can do. Amen? So as you are receiving the word this morning, I want you to have that stirring in your spirit of just expectation of what God wants to do. If I have learned anything about God from Apostle Joe, he is always on the move. God is always moving and advancing and expanding. And he's not just doing that for himself. He's doing it inside of us. Amen? So this morning, I want to talk to you about two words. Are you ready? Trust and obey. Can you say that? Trust and obey. When I was just preparing this week, I just kept hearing those two words over and over and over again. And I knew that the Lord was speaking to me. And I just started to think about my own journey with God. And I started to think, where is the fruit of trust in my life? Where is the fruit of obedience in my life? And I just want to give you some really simple, practical mindsets to walk with and bring into your everyday life with the Lord in order to trust and obey. Amen? Well... In Psalm 139.16, in the uh, English Standard Version, this is what it says. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Now, you may be asking, what in the world does that have to do with trust or obedience? But I remember the first time I ever heard anybody speak on this specific scripture, and it was Lou Engle. Do I have any Lou Engle lovers in the house? And he taught like only Lou Engle can on this one scripture, and this is what he said. God wrote a story about your life. I can't say it like Lou can, but just hear it in his voice. God wrote a story about your life before you were ever even born. God wrote a whole novel about your life, and then he said this. God doesn't write bad novels. I'm going to say that again. God wrote a story about your life. Not us collectively, although that's part of the story. Not the whole nation. Not every single person on earth. But he wrote a specific story. There is a book in heaven about you. Let that sink in. Luke Engel said this, God wrote a story about your life before you, ever, you were ever even born. God wrote a whole novel about you, and God doesn't write bad novels. And I can't tell you how many times in the last decade of following Jesus that I have gone back to that raspy voice in my head and reassured myself, God is writing my story, and he doesn't write bad stories. So every time I'm faced with something, uncertainty, difficulty, fear, whatever it is, 
I can look at him and know he's already got it in the book. And Jeff and I joke about this, and I joke about this with my mom, but every time there's been uncertainty in my life, I just remember God has a book about me in heaven. He didn't forget where I'm going to live. He didn't forget how to figure out how I'm going to make a living. He didn't forget my husband. I remember before I got married, that was such a big deal to me. I was like, God, I want to be married. That was a desire of my heart. And I remember just laying on my bed at ministry school and being like, God, he's in the book somewhere. And reminding myself, and God writes great stories. He's not an undetailed author. He has every single detail about your life already written down. You've just got to find where he's at in the story and align with what he's doing in your life. I have held on to those words. When I needed provision to stay at ministry school, I said, God, you sent me here. It's in the book somewhere. When I needed a job, when I moved back from ministry school, God, it's in the book somewhere. God, you promised me full-time ministry. God, it's in the book somewhere. God, we need a house. It's in the book somewhere. So I want you to think about whatever you are needing God to do in your life and be reassured it's in the book somewhere. You've just got to trust the author. I remember I read the Chronicles of Narnia when I was in high school. Has anybody else read those? I bet Morgan has. I knew I'd at least have one. And I loved the story that C.S. Lewis wrote through all of these different books. And I remember by about the third book, when the plot would thicken and it would look like there would be treachery and destruction and Narnia would be overcome by darkness, I would remind myself, because if I have any other readers in the room, you can get caught up in a story. And I would remind myself, C.S. Lewis is not going to write a bad book. This is going to have a great, miraculous, splendid ending. And when I would get caught up in the, the thickening of the plot or what looked like was going to be destruction, I would think, I can trust the author. He writes good stories. And I want to assure you this morning, God is a better author than C.S. Lewis. And he is the one who is pinning your story. You can trust him because he's a good author. He doesn't write bad books. Amen? So that's just one of the practical things that I remind myself when I am faced with whatever it is. God, I can trust you because of your nature, but I can also trust you because you're a good author and you're a good father. He never forgets a single detail. So be encouraged by that this morning. Matthew eleven twenty six says this, and this is Jesus speaking to the Father. Yes, Father, your plan delights your heart. As you've chosen this way to extend your kingdom, Jesus is letting us in on a secret. God extends his kingdom this way by giving it to those who have become like trusting children. I don't know what your childhood was like or if you even remember it or if you're a parent in the room, but good parents take care of everything for their kids. They teach them, they train them, but good parents can be trusted. And I had amazing parents. And I never went into any situation and thought, I wonder if I'm going to have a lunch today. Or I wonder if this need is going to get taken care of. Or I wonder everything that I had need of, ultimately God fulfilled that, but I was a trusting child who trusted my parents to take care of me. And I think that as we mature in the world, yes, we need to become independent of our parents. We need to become independent people. But our need to trust someone and lean on someone for guidance never goes away. Melissa Helser says it this way, maturity in the kingdom is opposite of the world. The more we would mature in God, the more dependent we become on him. And the more that I walk with the Lord, the more I realize, the more I surrender and trust, he can take care of it a lot better than I can. Amen? So, trust. Now we're moving on to obey. 
Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says this, Trust in the Lord completely, and do not rely on your own opinions. With all your heart, rely on Him to guide you, and He will lead you in every decision you make. Become intimate with Him in whatever you do, and He will lead you wherever you go. We're talking about roaring into March, right? We are going for it. Do I have anybody who's going for it in the room? Stepping out, getting out of the boat, doing what you don't think you can do because God's asked you to. But how do, how do we do that? What does that look like? And I know this is so simple, and I know Apostle Joe has been touching on this. We just listen for what God is asking us to do, and we obey. And it's that simple. I think we so overcomplicate following God. And I want us to be a people that, that are deep and extravagant and go deeper and learn and grow, but I don't ever want us to lose trusting, listening, and just obeying. And I was listening to a podcast this week, and a woman named Lauren Bentley said this, many of our struggles are just delayed obedience. Does that hurt anybody else? <laughs> Does that sting a little? Many of our struggles are just delayed obedience. And this is what I've learned about God. I can delay my obedience out of fear or mistrust or whatever it is, but as soon as I course correct and like Miss Loretta was talking about in her sermon, in her uh, class this morning, just plugging back in, God can immediately turn it around. So if you feel like you're lost or you're unplugged or you're struggling because of some delayed obedience this morning, just give him a fresh yes. Can we just say that? Yes. We say yes, God. So if you want Here's my main text. It's in 1 Samuel 15, and we're going to park there for a while and just talk about obedience. In 1 Samuel 15, it's the story of Saul and the Amalekites. Saul was the king of Israel at the time, and God instructed him to go out and fight the Amalekites. And this is what it says. Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, though he totally destroyed all of the rest of the people with the sword. Saul and the people spared Agag. And the best of the sheep, oxen, lambs, and everything that was good because they were not willing to destroy them entirely. But everything that was undesirable or worthless, they completely destroyed. So what's the issue here? Well, God had specifically instructed Saul, go into battle against the Amalekites and destroy everything. In the Hebrew, everything is everything. <laughs> and Saul was like, okay, God, I'll go, I'll go do that. But Saul keeps the best of the spoil. He looks at some of the good stuff that his enemy had and thinks, I'm sure God wouldn't mind if I keep this for myself. It's great. God wants to bless me, right? So Saul goes in and he's disobedient. And I believe that Saul disobeyed because he distrusted and so many times I think we disobey because deep down we don't trust the Lord. We think that he is withholding something good from us. And the crazy thing about this is the man who would become king after Saul pinned this in the Psalms. You will withhold no good thing from those who seek your name. The man who would take over power after distrusting Saul, learned what Saul refused to learn. God isn't going to withhold anything good from you. If he is asking you to step out and go for it, he's not going to let you drown. He's not going to let you sink 
Think about Peter. Peter stepped out of the boat, got his eyes off of Jesus, and Jesus didn't think, well, those are the consequences. (laughs) God is good, and He is faithful even when we aren't. And so you can trust him. He's not going to withhold anything good from you. And if you step out on a word from him, his word is what is going to hold you up. Saul was disobedient because he distrusted. So Samuel, the prophet, comes to Saul. And he rebukes Saul. And this is what he says. Has the Lord a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obedience to the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. So Samuel comes to Saul and says these words to him because Saul, immediately after he realized that he had been disobedient, He's like, I'm going to go make a sacrifice. So he takes all these good things that God asked him to destroy, the lambs and the oxen and all the livestock, and he's like, okay, I'll just go make a sacrifice and make up for it. And it was unlawful for Saul to do this. So he was trying to cover up his disobedience with something extravagant. I can't tell you how many times I've tried to do that. God will be like, go over here and do this. And I'll be like, here, God, I'll give you 30% of my finances. Go over here and do this. Well, God, I'll pray for the lady at Walmart. We're always trying to get out of something we're afraid of and cover up our disobedience with something extravagant. But again, this is what Samuel says to Saul. Does the Lord have great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obedience to the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. God isn't looking for an extravagant display. He's just looking for a yes, and a yes the first time. And if you don't say yes the first time, course correct and say yes, and he will turn it all around. Many of our struggles are just delayed obedience. And so if you've been caught in delay because you haven't been trusting the Lord, I want to encourage you this morning, you can trust him. He doesn't write bad stories. He's a great author. If you're in the thick of a a plot right now, be reminded that he is pinning your victory. And this is what I always remind myself when I'm facing something hard. God is plotting for my joy. And some of you need to hear that this morning. You're facing some hard stuff, or you're looking at some things that have been delayed in your life. And I'm here to remind you, God is plotting for your joy. He has figured out every detail, and all you have to do is trust and obey. Whatever you have been putting off, respond in obedience. Get outside of your comfort zone. Don't try to cover it up with something extravagant. Just trust and obey the Lord. And I want to close with this, and then Apostle Joe will come. I was, as soon as I heard these two words, I was like, I think that's a hymn. And so I looked up the hymn, Trust and Obey, and and the chorus says this, Trust and obey, there is no other way. To be happy in Jesus, just to trust and obey. And I want to encourage you, if you're lacking joy, Just say yes to him this morning. He can do anything and everything that you're believing him for. Amen. That was so good. How many people were singing the hymn with her when she was doing it? Okay, I'm not going to sing it, but that's a good one. You know what it says in Ephesians 4 and 1? This is so good. It says, as a prisoner of the Lord... Now, I don't know, has anybody in here um, maybe like ever been a prisoner, been in jail? Okay, I, I was there one night, but I didn't do nothing, okay? I, I didn't do it. I was like 20, 21. It was a big misunderstanding. But when I got there, I had to wear orange and I had to wear these flip flops. And I got thrown in, in like just with everybody. And I, I just kind of walked in and it was just kind of different. But it, it was just a little. 
I didn't really, seriously, I didn't do anything, but it was like a little traffic thing. But, but the thing is, when you are a prisoner, you have no say in anything. You wear orange and flip-flops, and you walk in, they tell you, if you need to go to the bathroom, there's the toilet. I said, there ain't no walls. And they're like, well, there it is, and we'll, we'll, we'll feed you, and we'll tell you what you're going to, you have no say in anything. So in Ephesians 4, 1, it says, as a prisoner of the Lord, so if you are really a prisoner of the Lord, you have no say in anything. Have you ever thought about it? It's like completely giving everything over. Trust and obey. <laughs> and it says, I plead with you to walk holy in a way that is suitable to your high rank. Do I got anybody in here that is called to have a high rank in the Lord? Whatever business, whatever place that you work in, whatever your calling is, when you follow the Lord and you trust and obey, you will get at a high rank. And then it says, given to you in your divine calling. Now, first thing, what does the word divine mean? It means God. So what it is saying is, what are you doing in your God calling? Every one of us has a God calling. Now, recently, my car, man, it looked like it was on hydraulics when it was going like this when it was driving. So I took it up to, to Joey Grisham, and I said, man, well, you know, my car, I don't know what's wrong with it. And so he said, oh, it's out of alignment. And they just went like, and it was perfect. It had little bitty little out of alignment things, and then it started driving good again. And I said, that was simply it. He said, yeah, it was just out of alignment the way it was created. To, it's a Honda Accord. You know, seriously, my, my car is real spiritual because, you know, the Lord, you know, they even said in the Bible that they were all in what? One Accord. And so the thing is, when you get things in an alignment with the God, as a prisoner, which means you have no say, every time I've messed up since I rededicated my, my life when I was 20, every time I got in, in trouble, it's because I got out of alignment and I had a better opinion than God and I wanted to change something. I'm like, God, when I truly become a prisoner, now being a prisoner, they tell you when to wake up, when to go to sleep, what you're going to eat, what you're going to, you don't even have to think to be a prisoner. But when you're with God, you can actually get to a place that he guides you. He leads you. Does the word not say that he will guide you? He will, he will lead you all throughout the scripture. So when you truly become a prisoner of the Lord, it says, I plead with you. He's begging them that you would walk holy in a way that is suitable to your high rank. We've got to get in a place with God that we serve as a prisoner unto him, walk holy unto him, because his plan is to advance us into what we are called to do. Now, you know, like, have you ever gone to the, the doctor and they give you some instructions and you don't listen, things don't work out right? You ever gone to a nutritionist and, and you're trying to, like, lose weight or you're trying to go, you go to the gym and you get a trainer and you don't listen, things don't work right? But I'm telling you, whenever you are going after the things of the Lord and things aren't working out, always do self-evaluation. You know, now when I was younger, like 40 and under, it was all y'all's fault. It was never my fault. I blamed everybody for everything. But then one day I realized, I felt like the Lord, I said, God, speak to me. It's kind of like, it's all your fault. And, uh, and when things wouldn't work out in my life, I always thought, it's everybody else with this or that. But no, no, the Lord always told me to always pray, God, do a work in me. God, change me. Keep me in alignment with your will. Keep me in alignment with the spoken word over my life. Let my life always align with the written word. So to become a prisoner of the Lord means that you truly have reckless abandonment in your life. And do you know how great it is to wake up every day and not really have to worry? Because I'm doing what you called O's charismatic saying from the 80s, there's always provision for the vision. And when God gives you a vision, like Michelle said, it, it's, he's going to bring it to pass. You really do not have to worry about everything. It, it's an old saying that I've heard a bunch of missionaries say, you fast and pray like it all depends on God, but then you work like it all depends on you. And when you work with the proper alignment, man, when I got my car back, that they did put two new tires on it. He said, man, your car was out of alignment. I got in that car, it, it drove so good, I thought I was driving a brand new Caddy or something. It's a 2012 Honda Accord. But it was driving perfectly because one simple adjustment. You got one simple adjustment. You know, when I talk to a lot of young people, I'm like, you're one move away, a business people, you're one move away 
from just stepping into something great. Now, uh, the word prisoner means a person who is confined or kept in custody with no opinion. And, you know, here's the thing. Your life, your life should make others want to serve God. Your, your personal life, people should look at you and say, man, I want to be a believer just because of you, just the way that you live your life. You know, your life should make others want to go after their calling. That, that's one of the things that, that I want my life to, to speak of is I want other people just to, to go for it in life. Your life should make others want to actually completely Go for it. Now, the Bible says that people are changed. How? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. Your testimony is so powerful. How People knew you when you was over here, but then when you came over here, how did you get there? It was by the Lord. I followed the prophetic word of the Lord. I, I, re, I rebuked my flesh, and I said yes to the Spirit. I started moving with the things of the Lord. Now, I'm going to give you a few prophetic words God gave me in prayer last week at the barn at 7 o'clock, Tuesday nights, the Lord gave me the word unclaimed and reclaimed. And the Lord said so many times, God has spoken a word to somebody, and they got it in their spirit. This is what they said. They never claimed the word. They never declared the word. They never decreed the word. I remember it was so crazy, but when the Lord called me to into ministry, it was like I was in prayer one day. Had my arms lifted. I was like, God, use me. God, and I know you're calling me. And he said, say, I am a preacher. And I'm like, I wouldn't say it because I don't want anybody to hear it because I was afraid they'd make me preach. And, and I wouldn't say it. Every time God tells me I'm going to do something, I would never say it. And, and now I just want to be, I have like, like, like a megaphone. When God puts something in my heart, I want to say it. I want to get it out. I want to go for it in my life. And the Lord showed me there's so many people that have unclaimed promises they've received them they've received them in here they've received them in their mind but they've never said anything about it that's why I ask people all the time what are you called to do they're like oh lord Joe's asking me and they won't tell me I want to know so I can haunt you and pray for you because the happiest people I've ever seen in my life I I remember one time I was with a, a real timid young man named Jeremy Gibson and, and we were praying for people, and he was like jumping over people. How's he not? La- he was just jumping, and everybody was falling out. And he was running and jumping. And he's like, whoa, I'm just going for it. I'm like, you are. You pray, they fall, and you jump over them. And, and, uh, and he just looked at me. I remember he said, I'm going for it with my life. And I'm like, yeah, go for it. I remember times I've seen different people minister freely, and, and they had this joy on their face because they're going for it. I remember one time we were in a meeting in Canada and, and Ryan Lestrange was praying for everybody. He was just like, I just love this. I'm like, yeah, we're praying for people. We go back to praying. He'd turn around and go, I love this. And I'm like, yeah, me too. And he keeps praying for people. And he was like, let's just go for it. And, it, and it's so fun to see people who are like, I'm going for it in a business. I remember I had a friend of mine. He worked at Alumax years ago, and he w- would do tile on the side. And he was sitting there one day, and he said, I got a huge problem in my life. I said, what is your problem? He said, I work Saturday and Sunday afternoons and make as much money on the side as I do at Alumax all week. And he made good money. And I said, brother, you don't have a problem. You got a blessing. He said, I love laying tile. I'm like, good. That's not my my calling. And he loves this stuff. And so he quit his job when his side job that he loved doing He's like, he's like an artist with this stuff. He took over, working a day and a half, making more, and he loved it. And then all of a sudden, he just doubled his um, finances, then tripled his finances as soon as he stepped out. And, you know, he said, Joe, this is what I know I'm supposed to do with my life. And I was like, man, that's awesome. So when you align with the word of the Lord and you claim what the Lord has spoke to you, it's going to happen. The second word was reclaim. Some of you stepped out on something and it didn't quite work the way you thought it would, reclaim that word and go for it in your life. Reclaim whatever it is. There's times that I have to uh, I reclaim different physical promises over my, my natural body, my, my physical body. And, and there's times that you got to stand on those words and reclaim it. If God spoke something to you and it's not working the way he spoke it to you, reclaim that word and go back in and go at it again. Now, a, a word that God gave me like a few days ago to go back into a word that I got, the Lord spoke to me in 2018 at the end of it, that the first 90 days was going to be a, a building time for a strong foundation. 
And then, you know, my wife and I, we were praying and we got the word about fasting, you know, fast pace, fast track, the first 90 days. And what the Lord was showing me is we're building a foundation to build upon. And even I felt the Lord say that what you as an individual, us corporately are going to build is a 21 months versus just nine months in 2019, but into 2020. And then the Lord spoke to me and said, a lot of people have started coasting, but there was 15 days left, 14 now. So I encourage you, the next 14 days you push into God. I mean, you press into God because we are building something. You are building something. At the end of the 14 days, a word God has been giving me strongly is there is about to be an acceleration. And, and what you have to understand is you, you, you build a foundation and then you build up from your foundation. And what God is about to do in some of y'all's lives is absolutely going to blow your mind. That's why I want people reading this book on character right now from Dr. Miles Monroe. Because where you are going to be advanced to, you've got to have some character. You know, there's a lot of people that the, in a, the, the greatest test you'll ever go through is the test of what? success and when you get that promotion at work and you walk in on Monday and you've been working with these folks for 10 years but now you are the one they report to is, is a little different you have got a test of success the first time you launch a business and you're barely getting by and then you get that big contract uh oh you got the test of success or actually have you ever been in a moment that you were praying for something and you got it and you were like I was kind of joking I really didn't think you were going to do this now what do I do with it you step into something See, a lot of us pray, I mean you, not me, you know. No, a lot of us pray for things, but we really don't know if God's going to come through. And when he does, it's a little bit scary. Like, okay, Lord, you, I was praying about something. I was praying for you to use me. And then, then when I stepped into it, now what do I do? But there's an acceleration coming. But for the next 14 days, I want you to push with everything you have towards the things of the Lord. Ephesians 1, 18, 19, and 20. It says, I pray that you will continually experience the, measure, the immeasurable greatness of God's power made available to you through faith. Now let's talk about faith. If you understand through faith that there's no measure to God... How much could you actually do? How much could you actually pray? How much could you actually declare? How much would you actually decree if you really thought that there was no measure to what God has for you? And one of the biggest things is some people don't believe in their self. God wrote a novel about you. And whenever, whenever you realize that, you will step into something. See, what, what God has done in my life is, is made me believe in him at such a great level that I really believe he can do anything. I really believe that he can heal anybody. I really believe that he can, every prophetic word he's ever spoken over my life can come to pass. I really believe every word he's spoken over your life can come to pass. And, and every person in, in our family, we all got that one heathenistic sinner that there ain't no way, no way they'll get saved. They're going to probably be the biggest evangelist in your family. They're the one that's going to come to the Lord. I remember at my 20-year reunion, uh, the, you know, the, you had to write your little sheet and fill it in. I sent it in. What do you do for a living? I sent it in. You know what they did? They sent it back. And they said, no, what do you really do? And I sent it back in. And they're like, you're joking me. I'm like, no, girl, for real. I had turned my life around. But you know what it was? I ran. Whatever I knew God called me, I tried to be the exact opposite. I mean, and so for years, I don't even know who I was or who I was acting like I was, but I was running from who I really was over here. I guess I was over here, but I was trying to live over here. I tried to be the, every time I felt the Lord speak something to me, I went and did the complete opposite because I completely ran from it. But now that I understand that, that I want to experience the immeasurable greatness of God's power. Now, why do we need God's power so much through faith? Go to the hospital and you'll figure it out real quick. Start talking to people at Walmart. You'll figure it out real quick. And, and when I pray for people, I'm like, God, if this person got healed right now, it would change. Have you ever seen a couple almost throw down at Walmart? It's crazy stuff. You dollar general, they, you, know, you go up there sometime, and, and, and the people are arguing, and you're like, Lord, let's just have some power show up in here. If you look at the world, the world needs the power of God. They'll argue theology with you all day. When someone gets healed, when someone gets out of a wheelchair, 
when, when, when some dude gets saved, they never thought would get saved, something's going to happen. The power of God is going to show up. Then it says, then your lives will be an advertisement of the immense power as it works through you. Hang on, somebody. The word in the Passion Translation said it would be an advertisement. You, you've got the advertisement of heaven inside of you. But the thing is, you've got to have faith to step out. I mean, really, next time you're somewhere and you see somebody that, that's got an oxygen tube, you see them on a cane, you see them, remember this, you are the advertisement of God and you've got the power inside of you that if you go lay hands and you've got faith, they're going to come alive. Now, next time you see somebody walking like this, they probably ain't got no purpose, no destiny, no nothing walking like this. Isn't it just great to lay hands on somebody, speak a prophetic word into their life, and all of a sudden they hold their head up because they believe in their self? You've got that power inside of you. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with your power? It says in Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give you authority. One translation is, Behold, I give you power. What are you doing with your authority? What are you doing with your power? And who are you encouraging? Man, if I walked up to somebody and I said, Hey, you know David Prince? Yeah. Hey, you know Jeff McFarland? Yeah. Hey, you know Dr. Stobart? Yeah. What are they going to say about you? You know, when, when somebody says, hey, Jojo Dawson, um, people say, oh, yeah, he believes in God. He believes in the power of God. He believes in that. I want to be, as the word says, an advertisement of his immense power. It didn't say just be a witness for the Lord. It said, no, be an advertisement of his power, his immeasurable power. We've got that power inside of us. You've got the power to give somebody a prophetic word, and it changes their life forever. You've got that inside of you. But you must understand, you've got to believe who you are in God. And when you believe that, there ain't no stop. I mean, there is no stopping you. You know, it's kind of like, like that. You, you are like a, a steamroller. You are like a freight train. I don't care how good you feel. I don't care how bad you feel. You will wake up every morning of your life, and you will move forward. Now, let me tell you this. When you uh, say that you want to live an accelerated life with the Lord, and you want to move forward, get ready. A lot of times your physical body will be attacked. You might not even be able to move forward in the physically, but, but a lot of times the Lord will have you walk through some physical things. He will have you walk through some things to match up with the prophetic, where every time I think I'm about to take off and run for God, something happens. I mean, dear Lord, I had something happen yesterday, and I'm like, no, I ain't got time for any of this. And it was like I wasn't able to move forward physically, but I said, no, I'm going to, because I'm not giving in to any things of the devil and when he brings something and then it goes on to say you know you got this mighty power working in you the same power that was released when God raised Christ Jesus from the dead and exalted him to the place of highest honor and supreme authority in the heavenly realm I'm talking the word says you've got the same power that God you God used God, you got the same power God used when he rose Christ from the dead. What are you doing with this power? What are you doing? You know what I want to do with this power? I want to raise a dead city. I, I, want, to, I want to raise a city. They say, Terrence Ken, oh, it's a city, that, the town that dreaded sundown. It, it, it's the town that every devil dreads because they don't want to be assigned to this area because we're going to have faith and we're going to have immense power, immeasurable power. But the thing is, the enemy will come against you in every... He knows your buttons and he'll know where to try to push them. But when you have that extreme faith and you understand that God has a novel about you and you're going to keep moving, there ain't nothing coming against you. Now, since I'm on this kick, I'll go and tell you that when you get ready to move forward, people will come against you. People will try to bring you down. Go for it. You got to go for it in life. And, and I have learned in my life that every word that God gives me, it will be challenged by people. And so when you believe in something, you got to believe in something so big that 10,000 people can come against you and you still be looking like, I'm still going to do it. And here's the thing. When I started being a, stepping into, into being a minister, everybody came against me. And now everybody who came against me is like, we're so proud of you, little Jody boy. I'm like, well, thanks. Thank you. We're so proud. We always knew you had it in you. I said, you a lie because you came against me so much. But, but now, oh, you want some prayer? Now I'll pray for you. I forgive. Come on now. And so, but the thing is, in your life, people don't see you. I mean, it, was, it wasn't even in my nose. I'm just rolling now. But what it is is, is, is you will get a prophetic vision of who you are and where you're going to go because God has showed you the novel. He says, look at page one. 
flips over. Look at page 30. Look at page 90. It's a long book, y'all. Y'all going to live long. Look at page 384. Look at 721. You're getting real old now. And he shows you all of this, but somebody else can't see that because it's not their life. But as, time, but as time goes on, then people will start to see. Don't worry about what people say. You just got to go for it in life. I remember the Lord speaks to me like, I want you to start aggressively going after what I have for you. And then all of a sudden, something happens and somebody says this or somebody says that. And you know what? I don't even care. I am so focused on God. I don't care. And this is what, when you're believing for somebody's healing and, and the doctor comes up and, and, and they, they say everything against the prophetic word of God, stand on the word of God. Whenever, whenever you want to step out and you want to launch something. I had a lady one time. She said, I want to start a nail salon, but they're everywhere. I said, what did God tell you, girl? She said to do, to do nails. And I said, well, do it. Who cares how many nail salons there are? Who cares what statistics say? My God is the statistic. Don't worry about what anybody else has to do or say. You know, I tell people all the time, they say, pray for my, my son, pray for my daughter. They're, they're prodigals. Pray for my parents, my grandparents. They're prodigals. But, but they keep messing up. I said, it just takes one moment. It just takes one moment for everything to turn around. Man, this is, yeah, that was fun. I just kind of got off. But... This is a season that you got to understand. You've got that immense power in you. My goodness, when you leave this place today, you've got to understand you've got it inside of you. And there is a world out there that is dying. I mean, just if half of this church, this section or this section, completely walked in, I think a whole city could be saved. But then there's 300 and what, 17 other churches in this city. If a few people from each church start getting the revelation of how much power we got, there will be so much revival, breakout, that, that it will change everything. You've got that power. So here's what you're going to do this week, homework assignment. You're going to lay hands on somebody who's dead in their destiny, and you're going to bring that destiny back to life. You're going to bring it to life. And then all of a sudden, you're going to hold them accountable, and, and then you're going to go up to somebody who physically has an infirmity, and you're going to lay hands, and you're going to see them restored because you've got that immense power. And then, now you might tell them, but you, you know somebody that their marriage is, is bad right now. You're going to attack that marriage like a bulldog, y'all. You're going to attack it like a pit bull. You ever been bit by a pit? I have three times. It hurts. But it wouldn't let go. I mean, you're going to grab a hold of a marriage. You know somebody who has a sick kid. You're going to grab a hold and pray for healing because you've got immense power in you. There is no measure to the power of God. You know, I was reading in this Miles Monroe book, and it said when somebody has true character and they walk in the room, everybody knows it. When somebody walks in a room and they have power, everybody knows it. That's you. You just got to understand how much power and authority that you have. So the word says, you know, one can put a thousand flat and two can put ten thousand. Um, and so, hey, what if you had twenty folks? Pray, do the math, because I can't do it that quick in my head. But it's a whole lot. We're going to pray for you today, and you're going to leave this place and understand how powerful that you really are. And you know the problem with 99.98% of the people in the world? I just made that statistic up, but they really don't believe who they are. And they don't know who they are, therefore they won't go for it in life. And, and I want you to realize that there is, we're going to manifest the kingdom of God in this city and it's going to happen at one person at a time. We're going to raise, we're going to train, we're going to disciple. And you got to find somebody at work. You may not even like them. You really don't get to pick the ones you disciple. God's going to show them to you. And, and, and he's going to have you to start developing these people and speaking into their life because we have immeasurable power. And there is nothing greater. You know, yeah, it's good to see somebody physically get healed. But when you see their countenance change right in front of you, that is the greatest thing ever. Just to, to see somebody. This is what, what I love about what, what I get to do. When people come up for prayer at conferences and they come up and their face looks almost distorted, just beat down with sin in life, and we pray and they turn around, everybody goes, oh, what happened to them? They encountered God. And they turn around and everybody's like, whoa. You're kind of like Moses, like your, your face is going. They had an encounter. You've got that power Listen, the world's not going to get saved inside of a church. If it would have, if it would have happened, that happened years ago. They're going to get saved in the world when, when we get that power and we take it to them. So we're going to pray. We want to pray for everybody here. And we're just going to agree with you. I got a few things I want to pray for. One, I want to pray for your biggest battle in your life is going to be won today. 
I mean, I am sick of, well, we're going to pray, and over the next 21 days, we're going to believe for your healing. No, forget that stuff. I'm talking today. We're praying today. Man, I need some healing in my body manifested. Dear Lord, I need this thing manifested today. And, and we're going to see these, we're going to see things broken. We're going to see your finances turn around. We're going to see delayed answers turned around. You know, and one word God keeps giving me is the word insight, insight, insight. Insight is a piece to the puzzle. You have a, I don't know about you, you have like a 500 piece puzzle and there's, it doesn't make sense what it is because you threw the box away because men don't read directions, look at the pictures because it's against our, you know, ethic code. And so you get that one piece and you put it in and you're like, it makes sense. God is about to get that one little piece and put it in and make sense to your healing, to your future, to your life, to your breakthrough, to your family. It's going to happen. So for the next 14 days, we're about to push in to the things of God. And you will have everything that God said you were going to have. And when we fully receive it, the world is going to receive the immense power of God. Because most people really don't think they have any power. Let me give you a hint. You really don't. It's him. Ephesians 6, 10 in the, in the Passion, he says he wants to do a work in you to do it through you. Now, it's the time that we spend in prayer is that him putting it in, and he's about to push it out. And this is a great season. So I'm going to pray just over you corporately. Then, then let's just see what the Lord does in, in, in prayer. There's no telling what's about to happen because we have immense power. <laughs> Lord, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you for all that you've done, all that you're doing, and what you are going to do. God, I just believe in, in every person here, in our, in our great region, in America, and all throughout the world, that you are about to show yourself strong because we believe the word of the Lord. We know the prophetic word of the Lord over our lives, over our corporate bodies. And God, we know that, that you have a plan for just the globe to be radically changed. And Jesus, I know that when you ministered and, and you spoke the word, signs, wonders, and miracles were always manifested. Today we declare that the word has been spoken. And, and God, I just, I just know and declare and believe that today people are going to be healed. They're going to be set free. They're going to be restored. Some people are going to be restored physically some spiritually, some emotionally, some financially. And there's some people that are going to walk out of here with a new perspective of life, a new mindset. They're, they're going to blow the dust off of a dream. Or they're going to be physically healed. Or maybe all the above. But God, I declare your word over these people today. I declare your word over the kids in kids' church and in the nursery. I declare your word over our region, Lord, and over our nation. And I just say, years of lack will be restored unto you today. Generational curses broken. I, I just feel the Lord saying, He is about to restore everything that has been stolen everything that has been taken away and there's going to be interest on it and I just feel the Lord said that, that you were going to have to learn to walk in the increase that there is an increase coming and you're going to have to learn to walk in this increase so Lord we just say yes over all of those words and Lord I just declare that your will be done for the remainder of this service amen